Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here with Stone Payton, another episode of GSUENI Radio. Stone, this is going to be a fun one. Hey, this is going to be a very special episode. We've had a great time all day. We've been broadcasting live from Georgia State University Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute, and we've caught up with some old friends, made some new ones. We've talked with students. We've talked with professors. It's been an absolute blast, but this one is going to be a little bit different. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to our listening audience, and welcome to the broadcast, back to the Business Radio X microphone, VP of Marketing and Community Development with Newport U.S., Miss April Stammel, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me back. This is so fun. Well, welcome back, April. And uh, update us on what's happening at the South Downtown. Uh, you did the pop-ups. They're still going on, right? Still going on. So that's what we're here to share a little bit more about today. Um, as we talked about last time, Newport owns a lot of buildings in this neighborhood that we're sitting in, uh, 48 to be exact. And uh, a few of our buildings were empty. And before starting construction this fall... Uh, we felt like we owed it to the community to offer them up to great businesses and ideas to see what they could do with them. And then when you thought of that idea and you're whiteboarding that out <laughs> and you're like, you think we, do, what was that like? You're going through like how many slots are there? Like you have, there was a lot of variables in this, right? And there, there was, was a lot of chaos and unknowns, right? There was a lot of chaos. <laughs> um, I'm glad to say that it turned out well. Um, but we, we moved our marketing center down there over the holidays. And so that was really the, the nail that hit the coffin when we said we have to bring more people down here. It didn't take a lot to transform our space into a great marketing center. It mm -hmm. felt really good to be on the street. And next to us, we had eight empty spaces and we just felt like, man, if it feels good for us to be on here, imagine if we had neighbors. <laughs> but it's, um, but you, were, the way you did it was so generous that you didn't charge, right? We this didn't was... charge. So we rolled out with an application process. Um, it was very ambitious from a timing perspective. So we announced it on March 3rd and we were having people move in and have our kickoff event April 11th. So within the first three weeks we received over 120 applications. Um, we had a great selection committee that included a Georgia State student, uh, Atlanta United supporter group leader, um, a downtown resident, uh, a city of Atlanta employee, and several other stakeholders that are really important to us. Uh, and that committee really helped us weed, weed out, um, we threw those applicants and helped the people around the table here um, become some of those tenants. And then you wanted, I uh, would imagine, them to kind of be buddies and help each other, right? You wanted to create kind of a collaborative environment. That's exactly right. So throughout the application process, we invited people in to come and look at the spaces. And that was the first time that several people would, several of the potential tenants would get together and start to collaborate and, and communicate together. Um, from that point, once the eight were selected, we invited them back in and had them all introduce themselves. And since then, we've gotten them together once every couple of weeks uh, just to check in and continue to foster that community on the street. And they've done a fantastic job on their own. I mean, they can share stories. Right. So we're going to get to know them in a little bit. But I want to understand kind of the vision of the whole, like, is it pop-up was a free space for a period of time. Yes. So we went out with four months, uh, April through the end of July. Mm -hmm. We actually just communicated with the tenants that we'll be able to extend it through the end of August. Oh. And that is including free rent and utilities. So we wanted uh, no real financial risk on their part to run their businesses, but we really wanted their investment to be in their time and their mm -hmm. creativity and um, them, them being on the street and trying to turn that space into something that was welcoming for all Atlantans. So now how has it kind of worked out for you now that you, when you walk into your building, you're not alone anymore. Now there's a bunch of people and their customers and things like that. It must be so exciting. I can't even put it into words. I mean, if this is even a small inkling or, or hint of what it's going to feel like down there once the renovation is complete, it's just, I mean, it's going to be such a special place. Um, and we hope that several of the pop-up row tenants become long-term tenants of mm -hmm. ours. That's a goal. Um, but yeah, it's just transformed the way it's felt on the street. Now, how has it, how has the neighborhood embraced this activity? 
Absolutely. I mean, everywhere from Castleberry Hill to North Downtown, um, we have had the privilege of speaking at several board meetings and community association meetings. Um, you know, these folks have their own following. So inviting those people in and cross pollinating the audience groups has been mm-hmm. really, really nice. Uh, but I would say that we've had an incredible amount of support. And then, um, how is your vision going forward? So after August comes, like say the rent ends there, or now they got to pay or things are going to change. Are you getting interest from other business people to want to go into that area? We are. It's been, uh, it's been really exciting. So we have a couple of neat leases we're negotiating now right. with local food and beverage. Um, I think there's a couple of pop-up row tenants that have expressed serious interest in staying. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to renovate the building. So there might be a, a quiet time a disruption, again. Disruption, right. Yep. But, uh, but we're going to do our best to make that as quick as possible so that these things can come back online soon. Now, when you launched, you had a big event with food trucks and all that. Um, yeah. Is there any other events planned? We do. So every Thursday we do food trucks from 11 to 2. Um, this week we actually have the food truck Slutty Vegan, which oh, is wow. That's yep, popular. very popular. <laughs> Took us a while to get that one locked in. Um, we the have, line's probably already started, right? Probably already started. Uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we're excited to have them. And really it's just we're, we're trying to do anything that we can to drive continual traffic to these pop-up tenants. Mm-hmm. Um, so the food trucks is just one of those. Um, you know, And then these guys all have their own events that they curate and craft and we do the best that we can to help again cross communicate that between the tenants now you mentioned there's 40 something buildings in play here Mm -hmm. how is that coming along or what's kind of the timeline on some of that activity oh that's my least favorite (laughs) question um no we uh we're planning our first phase of development will be on mitchell street which is where pop-up row is currently um, from there, you know, we'll move north up on North Broad or South Broad and then Peachtree Street, focusing one block at a time. Uh, our Mitchell Street, which includes Hotel Row and 222 Mitchell, um, that will start this fall and probably start to come online middle of next year, all the way through 21. So this is a long-term project for us. We see right. in the next five years the renovation of all of these 48 buildings and then we own about four acres of parking lots, which we think is great for future development potential once those buildings are full, the existing buildings are now, full. Now, and then the things that are being built are office buildings, hotels, condos, lofts, the whole... The new development mm-hmm. will be mixed use. I think just dependent on what the market needs at the time. Um, all of the existing buildings... You know, there's a couple of them that set up nicely for residential, but most of them will be creative office on the upper floors and then retail on the street level. And then um, for your kind of from being the marketing person, how are you seeing everything come together? I mean, it's been incredible. You know, when we started this two years ago, I would say that South Downtown you know, people would scratch their heads and be like, what? What's Do we even downtown? have that? <laughs> right. I didn't know there was a thing. Called- yeah, I didn't know there was a thing. I think over the last two years between us and what Underground Atlanta is trying to do and the Gulch and that redevelopment, um, South Downtown is now on the map as a neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And I think that in and of itself is a huge win. Are you going to have a catchy name like Sodo? Like, no, no. Like that. <laughs> we're just Nothing. going South straight downtown. up South, South downtown. downtown. Yeah, we're staying true. There. I was going to call it April Town. <laughs> April Town? No. <laughs> that doesn't have quite the ring to it. Sodo. Uh, Nobody's Sodo. Going, no one's on board with like Sodo. Hodor. So I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a funny story. Mayor Reed, towards the end of his time in office, he actually at a press conference called it Sodo. And we were all just uh, crashing inside. <laughs> um, we wow. were trying really hard <laughs> to, to just let it be South, south downtown. downtown. All right. Yeah. So South Downtown it is. Thank it's you. official now. <laughs> okay. So who'd you bring with you? Um, so I brought three. I wish I could have brought all eight, but I bought three of our uh, star tenants. Um, we've got Sean Keating here with Key Beverages, and I can't wait for him to share a little bit about what they're doing. We've got Courtney here with um, Atlanta Makery, and she has her own jewelry company, Agape Gems, so two, two-pronged. And then we have Otis Damon here, uh, and he is an incredible crafted hat maker and so i can't wait for people to hear more about his business and craft all right let's start with uh sean he seems the most confident (laughs) the most caffeinated probably for sure (laughs) that's definitely true (laughs) so tell us about key beverages how are you serving folks um yeah so we have a pop-up that was gifted to us through Newport Developments. And gifted, we're calling it gifted. I like that. <laughs> I would like, like to think so. You know, we uh, have the opportunity to have this pop-up, which, you know, it's a big thing to not have to pay rent or have, worry about utilities or... 
the costs that go along with opening up a business, um, which is really exciting. So we thought that we would kind of share that with anybody else. Like we filled our space with um, plants and we have uh, local artists that have pieces hanging in there so they can come in and see. So we thought we would basically just give the space away that was given to us as well. You know, we also, uh, we do a bunch of cold pressed juices. We do uh, kombucha, nitro coffee, a um, few other things on tap. Um, yeah. Well, your background isn't in the beverage industry. Uh, no, it is not actually. You're um, a math guy, a right? Math, what? Math. Math. Accounting? No, that's actually my business partner, Keaton. Oh, so, so you're not he, the accounting person. No, he... Because I would like to know the math of this. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> me too. We're still figuring that one out. Um, no, but it was really interesting. You know, we both actually left our jobs, um, especially Keaton working at uh, PwC, which is, you know... That's a, big, a real job. A big job to leave, <laughs> you know, to, to make drinks, you know, essentially. Um, and essentially not really knowing what we were doing starting out and you kind of learn as you go along the way. But, um, yeah, it was definitely a leap of faith to kind of branch out like that. So now was this your first location or you had a location before? Uh, this is, so we kind of started this whole thing with a bike cart, essentially, you know, mm-hmm. a kind of like a Dutch looking bike cart with a big, that wheelie. It is the did, coolest did you, looking bu- cart. Was it wheelie? Uh, no, it wasn't a wheelie. Do you uh, know what that is? I have no, that, no idea it's what a, a Dutch is. company that sells carts with coffee. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they got nothing on us. <laughs> so um, this was your own original concept? Uh, slightly. Like we saw it and it was, I think originally an ice cream thing. You uh-huh. reach in it. Um, and we kind of took the whole thing apart and rebuilt it and put a tap tower on it with, you know, we're able to so you built your drinks own out of thing it. That was your own proprietary coffee yeah, correct. cart. Uh, yeah, essentially, yeah. So we, and it wasn't just coffee. You know, we started out going out on the belt line and just bringing this thing out there, not knowing like. Just going for, um, yeah. just like a lemonade stand on wheels. <laughs> Basically, we were little kids with an idea. And, um, so essentially we tried to just provide healthy options for people. You know, we did different cold pressed juices. Everything's fresh made, um, different kombuchas that mm-hmm. we made and, you know, still tinkering with some of our flavors and other stuff. Um, coffee. And we offered all of this to people essentially for free. We did like a, a pay what you want kind of business model and people would walk up and well, be, what did they want to pay? It was actually really surprising. Mm-hmm. You know, people paid a lot more than I would have thought that they would, you know, and, it was actually really refreshing to see once you gave the option to somebody. You could have it for free. You could pay us fifty bucks. You know, you could you could do anything. Sky's what was the, the most you ever got? Fifty dollars. Somebody paid fifty wow. bucks for Whoa. yeah for a cup. <laughs> that is cool. Uh, but you know that that kind of there's other people that that don't pay, and you know those people that are able to give a little bit more, they kind of cancel out that, and everything right. everything evens out in the wash, you know. So now you're doing this cart, and then at some point you're gonna like have dreams of having a coffee, like an actual physical brick and mortar store. Or what was the intention? You know, we actually tried to pivot it. So we were like, all right, we're just gonna do wholesale everything, and like we essentially thought we were gonna do a very mobile vending style of business, and we quickly learned that it's a a big headache to try and hire all those people and, you know, get the contracts in order to be in the right places at the right times and loading up and making sure everyone, everything works right. And so we quickly learned that that wasn't necessarily what we wanted to do. So um, once this opportunity kind of arose with pop-up row, we were able to, well, maybe we've never thought about having a storefront, but these people are allowing us every opportunity that's available to bring this to fruition. So, so you said, let's go for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, why wouldn't you at that point? You well, know? because now you have to buy equipment, you have to buy all the stuff. Well, so we've uh, had a lot of the equipment to begin with, you know, we slowly have been buying stuff, you know, scaling up little bit by little bit. Um, but we work out of, um, a shared kitchen space that's in Chambly, um, which we still do pretty much everything out of at the moment. Um, so we're constantly looking for more space. That's always been, the biggest issue that we've run into. It's like we can't produce enough product to be able to supply everyone that we would like to, you know, so it's a slow kind of like build up 
um, to where we're looking at actually a bigger space um, with our friends at Newport, mm-hmm. possibly. So, so you're staying in, you're looking to stay in that same area because you started in the Old Fourth Ward. And now you're kind so, of migrating over to South Downtown. We we did start in Old Fourth Ward, but you know, being a small business and not having a ton of capital to start out with, it's you're kind of already priced out of the hip neighborhood you know hey 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 hey, watch it south downtown is hip uh it is extremely did i say that no um but i mean you know cost per square foot is a big issue when you're looking at the viability of your business and how much you can afford and xyz and you know to have somebody that you've gotten to know and that has your back and it's uh kind of a different different way to enter into a new chapter so now partnerships are an important component of your um, your business. How do you kind of find these like-minded organizations to partner with? We honestly just throw it out there for people to respond back. You know, we, we wanted to – there's not a lot in South Downtown at the moment, and, and it is growing, And but there's also people that have lived there for 20 years, and they've seen, you know, economic booms and downfalls, and, you know, so – we like we started uh, partnering with Yoga Works to provide you know a donation based yoga class every Saturday, and I, I think it's just a good opportunity to be able to do something like that for the folks that actually live down there and they're there twenty four seven. I mean, we're pretty much there twenty four seven now as well. But um, you know, just it's small little partnerships like that that we we want to give what was given to us back to everybody else. And you're also trying to create a community down there that maybe they were in silos and now there's kind of a connecting place. Oh, definitely. And I think that we've already started to create our own community and we welcome in every single person that walks in the door. But, you know, there's times where nobody's there for a little while and, you know, you know, Otis or anybody will walk down the street and pop into everybody else's shops and just say, Hey, what's going on? You know, like, what are you up to today? What's going on? What you got on the agenda? And, um, so it is, it has been a real sense of community just with the people that are down on pop-up row, um, and the people that are in the office, um, Ansley and April that, you know, kind of help facilitate and run everything, keep everybody in line. And (laughs) so now what's, What's next? You're looking for a permanent space somewhere. Maybe it's down here. Maybe it's yeah. So we're uh, so you, kind of you're all you keep putting your chips back at doubling down. Exactly. <laughs> I mean that's that's what you do as an entrepreneur. You put everything into it. You you never want to stop growing. Mm-hmm. And so we're you know space has been our biggest inhibitor. And we're so we're at that point where we have to expand again. We have to shed that shell, the exoskeleton, and move into something bigger and. Are you still doing the pay as you go model and uh, payment or uh, we pricing do now? In a, we, so we we do like a more structured pricing in our South Downtown location, but we still kind of like to keep that alive. And we have like um, a kegerator at Mountain High that's completely donation based, and you know we throw kombucha and kefir soda and mm-hmm. other probiotic options in there, um, and people can take them for free or donate to it, or you know. Same con- same concept, except no one's there watching you. So <laughs> it's the honor system. So uh, if somebody wants to learn more, a website. Uh, yeah, our website is keybeverages dot com. Uh, it's got like all of our bios and information. Um, or you can hit us up on Instagram at key dot atl. Um, we're really active on there and kind of do most of our promotion and push you know push outs through that platform. Good stuff. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, you can hear it in Sean's language pattern and just the way he articulates what he's doing, how he's doing it, why he's doing it. Your value system it seems to be so wholly consistent with, I assume, Newport in general, but certainly April. And I'm about to learn probably Otis and, and Courtney as well. <laughs> no, so – Were you in search of that? Was that a happy accident, April? It was a happy accident because, like I mentioned, we had a a selection committee that helped us go through those 120 applications. And what came out of that um, was surprisingly aligned with what we would have probably selected anyways. Uh, So that was really refreshing. Um, And I'll say that, you know, you asked a question, Lee, about how partnerships and how you find the right partners and everyone on Pop Up Row is good people, and good people attract good people. Mm-hmm. And so the feeling that is on Mitchell Street right now, it just feels good. 
And we just hope to foster that and continue to take it forward no matter who is on the street. But um, yeah, we definitely strive to have good people as a part of our merchandising mix. Good stuff. So next up, who do you want next? Uh, so let's get Courtney involved in here. This is Courtney Johnson. She's the owner with Atlanta Makery and Agape Gems. Agape, is, does that mean like some form of love in some language, yes? It does. So it's um, the Greek word for God's unconditional love. You knew that, Stone? I did, see, I am far more well-rounded than you. I did not know you knew that. No. He's full of knowledge. <laughs> So, I'm full of it. That's my wife says that all the time. So tell us about Atlanta Makery. Yeah, so um, Atlanta Makery is uh, a collective of Atlanta makers, artists, and designers. Um, there are 24 featured in the store right now. Um, and so you can get anything from jewelry to apparel, um, men's designer socks, chocolates. What about hats? I love hats. <laughs> I don't sell hats, but I do direct a lot of people a few doors down. <laughs> That's where all the hats are. Yes. Incidentally, the formal term for that is Milner, just in case you didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> More knowledge. So what? how'd you come up with the idea of a makery where it's kind of a cooperative where all these people are together? So I have had my own handcrafted jewelry business Um I've been doing it for about 15 years, the last three years as my full-time job. And wow. Good for you. Thank you. And um, about 75% of my business for that is just doing festivals around Atlanta and popping up at other retail locations. So and you, you, at some point, you didn't sell anybody anything at a festival, and then you went to your first festival. <laughs> Do you remember how nervous or what that was like, excitement-wise? Um, I don't because it was so long ago. Um, <laughs> that was probably a good 15 years ago. Right, but like here, you got all your stuff. What am I going to pick out? How am I going to – like that must be so yeah. – like it's exciting, but I'm nervous. I hope somebody buys something. Like what was that? I can't even imagine. I am sure I was super nervous in the beginning um, and – especially as an artist, most artists can relate that you feel like you're selling part of yourself. Right. You know, I want you to buy these earrings, yeah. but it was my creativity that put that together. So you're buying, you know, a part of, a part of me. And so if you don't buy it and you walk away, you feel like, oh, they don't like they me. They rejected me. Yeah. And what about pricing? Like, how did you come up with pricing? That has been um, a long journey. <laughs> um, actually, about three years ago, I hired a business coach. Um, and that was one of the first things that we tackled um, because – also, as an artist, sometimes you feel like you don't know how you place value beyond, you know, the materials. Right, because art something is and, subjective, right? Right, and right. you know, you could buy a dress at one place and it's ten dollars, and another place it's a hundred dollars, another place it's ten thousand dollars. Right, right. So finding that happy balance of, um, you know, there's the overhead and the materials and the time that goes into making it, but also I need a place to live. And <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yeah. how do you? Is there any formula or you just kind of go with your gut feel? Um, it's honestly a very complicated Excel spreadsheet. Really? <laughs> yeah. There's an algorithm for this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't um, I don't price anything like just off the cuff anymore. Everything so goes. So you used to though. I did. You'd be yeah. like, eh, 20 bucks. Oh, that's 40 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then at the end of the year, you're you like, I hope I made money. <laughs> right. And you're like, oh, I spent. That was wrong. It, it, it was all wrong. <laughs> so I trust my handy dandy spreadsheet and, and let it do the math for me. Wow. That's fascinating. All right. So then you have this make this vision. So you, did you go out to people and go, who won, who's in? Basically. <laughs> so, um, because I've been doing the festival circuit in Atlanta for the last few years, I've met a lot of really good quality artists, um, who make a good product, but that are also really good people. And mm -hmm. so, um, I reached out to that network of other makers that I knew first. Uh, and then, um, actually April and Ansley from, um, pop up row were able to refer me to a few other makers who had applied for a space and right. they weren't selected, but they had really good products. So like the, um, artisan chocolates that I carry are from, um, so there's chocolates too so making yeah. is not just stuff there's food there's food <laughs> so it's a local chocolatier she's based in old fourth ward and she makes the most delicious dark chocolate bars mm -hmm. and truffles and amazing, amazing. who is that <laughs> um her name is ellen um and i think it's just chocolates by ellen mm -hmm. chocolates by ellen there you go and then so you just kind of collected these people yep so i rounded up my 
my crew <laughs> of other makers and artists and designers. Um, and I was really excited to be able to offer the opportunity for them to showcase their products in a place where it doesn't really cost them anything. So um, there's other maker co-ops around Atlanta. Obviously, it's not a brand new concept, um, but this one, they don't pay anything for their um, booth space. They pay a small commission off of the items that I sell for them. So um, you're the one physically there? Yes. So, and some of the makers do come in and work a shift every now and then in the store or they'll cover on the weekends if I have a festival to be at. Um, but I'm primarily the one who's in the store. And then, um, you work with some underserved market women and veteran makers. Yep. So, um, I have 24 makers featured in the shop right now. And of those 24, 23 of them are either, um, a minority owned or woman owned business. And then was that an accident or you purposely set out to do that? Um, a little of both. So I was hoping to give the opportunity to some people that I knew were, um, kind of in the startup phase and really hadn't had an opportunity to either sell wholesale or, um, were so new to the maker market in Atlanta that they weren't going to get featured in one of the bigger co-op stores. So, um, that was, that was my initial, um, what I was looking for. And then I sort of looked at my list and realized that, oh, oh <laughs> this is nice. That worked out. <laughs> yeah. So now, um, you've been in the maker world for a little bit. Is there any, uh, educational opportunities for new makers? Do you do any workshops or things like that? So I will be doing a workshop, um, mm-hmm. probably towards the end of July, um, to invite other local people who are either in the beginning stages or who are thinking of launching their own brand to talk about what are the, the beginning steps and what are the hurdles um, and just sort of a reality check that nobody gave me at the very beginning. So what, what is a piece of advice for a young maker out there that is thinking about doing this? Or, you know, I guess it starts out, you're like, I like making this whatever. And then you're like, I, you think it's good. Your friends say it's good, right? Yeah. And then well, first, you your mom says it's good. The Agape worksheet, Excel sheet, right? <laughs> you right. The pricing worksheet, the proprietary pricing worksheet. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that is one of the first things that I talk to people about when they ask me, um, you know, how do I, how did I build a wholesale business and those sort of things is really to get a hold of your pricing because otherwise you're not running a business, you're running a hobby that might actually be costing you money and not making you any money. Right. Art for art's sake. Right. <laughs> right. Which is fine if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Right. But not a lot of people set out to do that. Right. right, right. <laughs> the goal is to pay your rent. So it's a golden ticket. <laughs> so now when did you have that aha moment of, Hey, I might be able to do this for a living. Like I could do this. I'm getting enough business. Um, I did not have that moment. Um, You're still waiting for that moment. No, I just, uh, I took a different route. So, um, my previous work experience was running nonprofits and I had been running um, an organization here in Atlanta for a few years and I have two small children and I just felt like I was never seeing them. And so I was doing all this work um, and we, we served young kids in the organization. I was like, I'm doing all this for other people's kids and I don't right. see my own. <laughs> um, and so I had been praying about it for a long time um, and I just decided that it was time to just take the leap of faith and go and do what I wanted to do. And so that's what I did. <laughs> so you've always been doing jewelry like on the side, like yeah. just as a hobby as a kid? Yeah. So um, since like my early 20s, I had been doing jewelry as a hobby and making gifts and, you know, doing the, like the occasional festival or, you know, mm-hmm. little church festival at Christmas time, those sort of things. Um, and then I had two kids. And so I stopped because all the pieces that I used to make jewelry are choking hazards. And so, um, so I took a few years. Yeah. Um, and my studio also became or a just nursery. Use larger items. <laughs> so I took a break for a few years, um, and then went back to working full time, uh, and two years into that just felt like that's not what I was supposed to be doing. And so, um, at that point I really hadn't been making any jewelry for about three years. And so when I quit my job to make jewelry, everyone obviously thought I was crazy (laughs) and I was for a little while. Uh, and then about a year into that part of the journey, um, I applied for a competition through Belk department stores and won their Southern designer showcase competition. And so that put my jewelry into 10 of their stores. And that was sort of, now it's game on. Yeah. And then suddenly my mom didn't think I was so crazy anymore. (laughs) Right. I told you you should do that. Yeah, she stopped sending me job listings. <laughs> right. 
So now, how'd you hear about the South Downtown Pop Up opportunity? So there's a group on Facebook called Atlanta Pop Up Posse, and there's a ton of local makers that post uh, information about festivals and just mm-hmm. opportunities to pop up for your brand. And someone on there posted the link that was on, I think, the Atlanta Business Chronicle about. Um, this opportunity. And it was interesting that everyone who commented on it was very negative about like, oh, you have to jump through all this red tape and you have to deal with city of Atlanta and all these sort of things. And I just, I didn't say anything. I just slyly went and sent my application in. (laughs) And I'll say one of the things that really attracted us to Atlanta Makery was the fact that she was a compilation or a collective right, of all these other right. makers. And so when we got an application from Ellen, um, the out. chocolatier, we, we loved her product. Right. We just couldn't imagine a 750 square foot of chocolate shop. Chocolate shop right. So we, you know, the idea of having this one place where we could recommend a right, couple it's of a other mashup applicants. of a bunch yeah. of the good ideas in one place. And I mean, the amount of money I've spent is not good for anyone <laughs> uh, in my household <laughs> in the Atlanta makery. Um, but it is, it serves a lot of audiences because there's such right. a wide variety of product offerings right so that was a perfect fit perfect and then uh so how do you see this expanding and growing from here i have so many ideas so (laughs) (laughs) one of the things that i really hope to be able to um to add on is to have spaces where makers and designers could have workspace because so many of us work out of our home and don't have an actual studio space and a place Mm -hmm. to have appointments with people who'd like to do custom orders or stores that would like to make a purchase so um Sort of having a space that's half retail, but also half like studio a working space. space, right? Mm-hmm. And then it's kind of like that commercial kitchen, right? Where it's like you can go in there and work, and then right sell your wares, right? And then, um, how has it been for you personally to kind of be in there and every day and? It's awesome. So uh, I think so many people have the dream of being able to have their own storefront, but it's. Um, cost prohibitive most of the time and so to be able to have this experience and to figure out the kinks and to work it all out without having the the pressure of the overhead is an amazing opportunity and what was it like that first time you opened the door and then people start coming in um it was overwhelming and um i think we all knew that the opening day was gonna be a Kind of Extremely crazy day. overwhelming. Yeah, but it was like, they're here. <laughs> I think uh, the paint on the walls wasn't even dry by the time people Probably were coming <laughs> right. um, And people just kept coming all day. Actually, that whole weekend of kickoff. So... Um, it was really incredible. And I think I probably was like halfway through that first day before I took a step back and just sort of looked because um, we were all in our stores the night before until crazy hours of the morning getting things finished. And right. so yeah. I think I missed that moment to like take it all in. Oh, totally. Um, I thought we were going to have time to walk down and check out everybody else's designs. <laughs> <and everybody else's laughs> stores. I don't think I even walked out the door until, you know, 6 p.m. at night. Yeah, I missed the food trucks and everything. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> but that was awesome. So. Right. That's exactly what you would hope for. And then um, you make a point to have socially conscious brands that, again, is not an accident. That's part of the branding of your work, right? Yes. So um, to me, it's really important that you have a spirit of giving. And so my brand, Agape Gems, gives a portion of our sales back to an organization called A21 Campaign that works to fight human trafficking, which um, you guys probably know is a big issue sure. in Atlanta. But they do it... Um, locally and internationally. And so I really wanted to find some other brands that had some give back or um, at least were socially conscious with the way that they source their materials and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. So uh, like I carry a brand of leather goods called Bernice London, and she only uses upcycled leather in her products. Uh, I have another brand called Nika Life that um, is based here in Atlanta, but she has women and children, or I shouldn't say women and children, women in Nicaragua <laughs> who make the jewelry, but there's women and children who benefit from the right. sales of those pieces. Um, they run an education program for the kids. And um, I have like some little bracelets in the store that are only $6 and the um, sale of those go to buy iPads for the kids. So just people who are thinking beyond just uh, just making a dollar for themselves. So now that you're kind of a seasoned entrepreneur now, is this the way you imagine it to be? <sighs> you know, I think it's better than what I would have imagined. Um, this This project happened so fast. I don't think I had time to imagine what it was going to be like. It was just, oh, I got it. And and we're we're opening next week. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And so it was just go, 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 go. But um, I mean, from the the other people who are on the block, I think I've made some longtime friends that um, hopefully we'll be able to work together in the future. And I had 
just amazing customers who come in and share stories and people who buy things and give it as a gift and then come back to tell me the story about right. giving it. So it's been amazing. Right, whereas a festival, they buy and you never see them. Right, right. right. Um, and so it's cool to be able, because I still do some festivals, it's cool to be able to tell people, here's where you can find, find me, me. And there's these other incredible makers that you right. can find. And you can shop in air conditioning because <laughs> <laughs> it is so hot to do the festivals right now. So now if somebody wanted to learn more, what's the website? Um, if you wanted to learn about the jewelry, it's agapegems.com. Um, and then you can follow Instagram for um, either at agapegems or at Atlanta Makery. All right. Before we hear from our headliner, uh, I, I just got to say to everybody here in the room, but uh, particularly to, to April, this, this sounds like the, I would love to have a studio right in the middle of a pop up, not, and not even because of the financial advantage, right? Just hanging out in a community like this, this, where you've got this like minded community where everybody's trying to help each other out. It just sounds like a, like a neat environment to be a part of, doesn't it? Yeah. And April, this is, these people are kind of pioneers, right? Like they're kind of going in there and they're taking a shot. Yes. Taking a very big risk. And we were really upfront with all of the tenants at the beginning that, listen, you're going into an area of Atlanta and a neighborhood and a street that people haven't been familiar with and haven't had a reason to come to in a long time. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of existing tenants and I want to make sure I don't forget about them that have been on the street for a while. Uh, Friedman Shoes, My Fair Suites are two of them. <clears throat> and even those tenants have purposely come into our marketing center in our office and commented about how different the street feels. I mean, Friedman's has been on the street for 80 years, and he said it hasn't felt – I mean, they haven't they haven't had the street feel this good in a really long right. time. Right, and that's been more of a destination. Yes, definitely right. a destination. Um, so, yes, they took a big risk. Uh, they went with it and, you know, they knew it was going to be a lot of work to drive their own audiences down to the street. And we were certainly going to do our part. Uh, but it's just it's just been like a, a great experience for everyone so far, I think. Now, what about the, you know, the Newport folks as an international company, you know, to see an experiment like this actually, you know, be on a whiteboard now it's real and it's happening. It's, it, uh, how it's, are they handling this? <laughs> um, I will say they are really proud of our Atlanta team. Mm -hmm. um, they have come yeah. over here, I want to say probably four or five times since the pop-up shops have been open. They come quite often and they are constantly in these folks' businesses, um, having conversations, supporting them by purchasing <laughs> lots of goods. <laughs> um, and I just think overall, you know, coming from a European perspective, um, they love the buildings and they knew they were buying something special in right. the, the make, uh, makeup of the buildings. But I think having our approach to offering these buildings for pop-up row, um, see that be so successful makes them really proud. Yeah. I, I hope to see this in lots of different markets around the country because I think it's wonderful. Thank you. So now who's the headliner? All right. You ready for this? And this yeah. guy's been so patient. He's been yeah. nodding his head. He's been cheering everybody on. Please join me in welcoming to the program Milner hat maker, Otis DeMond. How are you, man? I'm good in yourself. I am doing well. I'm sorry it's radio and that folks cannot see the hat on the table. <laughs> I'm sure that's one of a whole just slew of marvelous looking pieces. But tell us a little bit about the hat making business. It's, to me, it's kind of like cliff diving. How do you even know you're good at something like that? <laughs> I started at 15 years old. Um, your, your first create, hat? Creating heart headwear, yeah. For, like, how, how do you It begin? started off with clothes. <laughs> I couldn't read pattern guys. It was like math to me. So then I was like, I can't do this. So then I started doing, like, uh, soft cloth hats, drawstring pants, and something about headwear just stayed with me. I um From sewing the soft cloth hats, I went to reconstruction, buying, like, pre-made brims and cutting them up. Mm -hmm. uh, my family was really into church, so I would make my mom's hats. My pastor's wife, I would make her hats. Then from there, I was uh, at Nassau Community College in, in New York, and <laughs> my professors... Yeah, that accent doesn't sound like... Uh, I got a little Smyrna. bit of both now, because everybody's Smyrna saying I sound, I sound Southern. I don't know about that. <laughs> Especially when I say here. <laughs> but... um. They didn't want to put me in a, I wanted to be this buyer that traveled the whole world and all that kind of stuff. And, um, so you just initially you didn't want to be the maker of the hats. You wanted to buy. No, I wanted to be a buyer uh -huh. and my professors and the head of the department of fashion buying and merchandising was like, we can't put you in a buying office. We have to put you with a milliner because your hats are so awesome. Wow. So you so, just had a knack for it, right? Yeah. So, and I'm pretty much self-taught. Then I interned with Lola, uh, Lola Ehrlich of Lola Millinery in New York. 
She's my last living um, mentor and her hats are all over the world. She just opened up a, a shop, I think in Paris, France. And I still talk to her. And when I get low or need some kind of advice, I call her up and she tells me what to do. But, um, I've always worked the job with it. Um, my last job, I was a building inspector. Great job, great benefits, great money. But, but not, after a day there, you're not, going home and not, making hats? Yeah, and I had to fix everybody's problems. And I, and I would leave there, go to my design studio in New York. And I was like, I'm done. I'm moving. I, so I packed up. I went on vacation, packed up my stuff, and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. How'd you pick Atlanta? My mother. Because <laughs> I was Your going. Your mother picked Atlanta. I was going. I was going to L.A. and she was freaking out, saying, "There's no one there. If something happens to you, we can't get to you fast enough." I'm like, "Mom, I'm 41 years old. <laughs> it never ends." So it never ends. I didn't go to Germany because of her. <laughs> Back when I was 19, so I came down the coast, and I've been here. October would be six years. Wow! And um, then, so how has it been? It's been. It's been trying. It's the scariest thing ever. I've ever done. Um. I finally had to take a chance on me because I was a fixer. So I would find projects and people and try to help them and whether it was the community or individual. And I was like, you know what? This is the only thing that gives you peace. And that's when I I was like, I'm just going to take a chance on the hats. Um, When I got here, I freaked out a little bit um, because I realized I didn't create a community. I have very, you know, very little people here. Um, Thank God. Like in New York, you had... A community. I had a community. I had a client, a clientele. Right. Um, I had my design studio. So I was, I was good. Right. You had the whole um, ecosystem. You but need. when I tell you, I walked out on the water. <laughs> and that, so, I, so you come here and mm-hmm. you don't have a network built in. No. But and you're building it from scratch. Social media did it. Really? Thank God. Yeah. Social media. That's so like happened. Instagram? Instagram, Facebook. Um, if I had that when I was 15, oh God, it would, it would be crazy. <laughs> So now you start posting pictures of the hats pictures and people are like, hats. how do I get my hat? Mm-hmm. Um, people will contact me. I've got some work in the movie and film industry multiple times. Um, I just did something in September for Step Up, uh, a show, a uh, series. Um, who else? A few celebrities come to me. So it's like sometimes, you know, because you're posting it online, a celebrity will go, hey, make me a hat. Pretty much. Like out of the blue, complete. Out of the, out of the like blue. at first, so then you're like, you're not really the celebrity, right? You, you can't believe no. them at first, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? You well, can't. well, when they when they reach out to me, I go and I do my research <laughs> and make sure this is legit. And then I call my sister who sings. And be like, is this who they say they are? You know, or somebody else. Um, I, I, I've met a lot of people here. Um, a few of them became great friends who are in the industry. So mm-hmm. they kind of. So now is there a certain kind of entertainer that likes the hats? Is this like a singer hat Um, or is it a movie star hat? Singers. A lot. I got a lot of singers who wear my hats. Um, Is it mostly men or women's hats? A little of both. A little of both. Which hat do you like to make? Is it more more rewarding Mm. for men or women or do you have kind of a... It switched up on me because when I first started, it was mainly women. Uh-huh. And now it's just men. But what happens is the women buy the men's hats. They like that man tailored. Uh-huh. Um, so how do you kind of come up with the ideas? Like fashion is so I don't, know, I don't do trends. I get the color scheme together. I pick out the fabrication and I just let my hands go to work. God is my guide. And so so walk me through. You make What's a hat making session look like? Do um, you make one hat in one session or it takes like a week? It, or? T- it depends on what it is. I love doing the felts. Mm-hmm. I, I really don't like summer hats because um, I can be a little more creative with the felts. And I only use uh, the best of um, fabrications. I use beaver felt, velour felts, um, Salome, suede. And, uh, so you have to buy all this stuff? Yeah. And just keep it in inventory in, I, in case the Sometimes I have strikes. a lot of inventory. <laughs> sometimes it's like buy the there's piece. A, depending there's a on beaver what it is. special. No, no, they they don't never have a beaver special. (laughs) They don't ever have a special. (laughs) And um, most of these materials come from all over the world. Some of them are here in the states. Some of how do you find them? How do you identify them? Um, friends in the business, other milliners, or just um. Google. There's like a milliner Facebook group y'all hang out in. There is one. I'm not on there too often because I I never want to get clouded with someone else's design. Right. So I kind of stay in my own little zone, which is good and bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, 
Now, are all the hats custom made, or you make a hat and then the person buys it and it fits, or it doesn't everything fit? is custom made? What I what I've been marketing Otis Demo Millinery as since I've been with um, the pop up community with Newport. Um, I market my shop as a design studio showroom. So people, I have all my hat blocks. I have over a hundred hat blocks there from all over the world. Wow! So it's like must be just like a museum. You guys have got to come there. down yeah. and see I it. Wish, we have yeah, fascinated. I wish I could go down to this place. Yeah. Um, I have four four uh, set up machines. There, they were made in 1847. One is a straw machine. One is a wire machine, and one, two of them are set up machines. So what's the hat on the table made of? This one is made out of straw. So that those are individual pieces of straw yeah but the straw is it comes in like strips and i just stitch it it's like maybe it comes to you in strips in strips yeah and you started out with strips don't get too attached to you, got yeah. your own hat. <laughs> <laughs> you already have a hat i know but they look so good I know. I mean, wow. actually i i uh refurbished sean's uh girlfriend's hat yes yeah, she brought it in there he like remolded it steamed yeah. it you know took care of her yeah. So now is that part of the service too? Like you buy a hat, you have to take care of it. It's not like you you're done, right? Yeah, yeah, you have to take care of that. <laughs> so what what are some hat taking care of tips? Um, I tell people to keep their hats, especially the summer hats, the straw hats, and cool. Uh, keep it in a cool, dry spot. Is there hat containers? I give every customer a hat. I have I had clients come to me saying I've, nobody ever gave me a hat box, and I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> you should always get a hat box. Uh, um, some people just walk out of the store. Some with people the hat. just walk out of the store, or retailers usually just give you a bag, <laughs> unless it's high end. But I will you, say there have been several hat boxes on the plane back to Germany. Yeah, so exactly, I'll just say that. exactly. <laughs> they are they are very nice boxes. Exactly. Well, I think that's a cool part about these handmade crafts and everything is that you know you can it beat it up you can and it doesn't just fall apart mm-hmm. it's not a throwaway it's like right these are craft you know people. otis makes right. something that he doesn't matter how much you beat it up he can whip it right back into shape mm-hmm. he can fix it back up and that's the point of why you buy something that costs a little bit more it's handmade it's handmade for a reason so now you've learned all this kind of on your own when mm-hmm. you like watching youtube videos no. <laughs> 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 no, I've learned it on my own, and I picked up from different uh, mentors. My my mentor Horace Weeks, he died in '07. He was a Southern man from Mississippi, came to New York at 19, worked for these two Jewish guys named uh, the the name of the company. First was Peter and Charlie, then it was Peter and Irving. He bought the company from them as they got older, and I would go in there while everybody was having fun and dating and partying while I, while I was in high school, I would be there with Horace watching him like till 11 o'clock at night sometimes. Like you were Dri- just... Driving him home to Washington Heights and I'm going back to Long Island. <laughs> and just to learn. You and were that to hungry learn, yeah. to learn. I don't know what it is about the hats. It just kind of stuff. It was the only thing that gave is me Is it peace. like meditative for you it to is. make it? Like it it's like kind of you get lost in it your is. own little zone? Yes. Very but, much so. Does it... I would imagine it helps... Uh, like from a stress standpoint, because there's a lot of stress of being an entrepreneur, well, I, but this I, is probably the escape part is making the hat. It is because I, I fell into it through depression. I suffered with depression and um, I didn't even know the name back then, but um, this at is what age at 15. So you were going through a tough time. I, I was contemplating suicide at 15 years old and confided in a high school teacher. And she had, she had me come to her class on my lunch every day. And she taught me how to sew. And from there, 31 years later, this is it. So sewing was the first outlet that it helped outlet. kind of. I wanted to go into to the medical field. Everybody in my family is in the medical field. Mm-hmm. Um, I may still do that a little bit. I'm mm-hmm. thinking of going back to school for uh, art therapy. Put a little purpose with passion. Right. You know, um, and see where it goes. I'm just not sure yet, but um, the hats is it. So now in your dream of dreams, how does this story end? I don't know. Um, 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 right now, everything is on faith. Um, I just try to show up every day that God gives me, create, make the business work. Um, I'm learning as I'm going. I'm so um, appreciative and thankful for uh, April Newport because I was at my wit's end when I seen the uh, the article 
And I was like, this is BS. Nobody's giving nobody anything. <laughs> so I threw, You're I from threw, New York. I threw, I threw, <laughs> this is some three card I was mommy done. I was convinced. <laughs> I was convinced that this was BS. And I just threw it to the side, told a friend about it who took a few more steps than I did and contact them, went down there, viewed the spots, put on the application and then told me. She was like, it's real. I was like, what? <laughs> she did it for you? She, no, she did her own. Oh, <laughs> her then I came back. I went on the computer, did mine, and I just waited it out the week, that weekend. It was the crazy, the longest weekend ever. That weekend for like a week. Cause you were, <laughs> you just wanted to be picked. I want, yes. So this is the first time I feel like I won the lottery. And I have never won anything in my life. <laughs> well, so it's a, it's a bless. It's been a blessing. Well, you do amazing work. Thank you. Um, it's been beautiful. Thank you. And what do you need more of? How can we help you? How can I? I want to educate people on, on millinery. Um, it's a dying it's trade. It's a lost art, right? It's a lost art. Um, I want to give back. I'm always looking for that kid that, that was me back when I was 15. Like That's my struggling and doesn't know their path. Yeah, and just teach them. It's not about, yes, the money. I want to eat. I want to have the nice car and all that. But that's not my main purpose. My main purpose is to give back and show somebody. But I'm I'm learning how to balance this out. And that's what's helping me, too, with this spot, balancing it all out. Because you can't just give everything away. You know, you have right. to pick and choose which what you can do and what you can't do. And then is there going to be an online element to your work where there's... You I, have know, a, people I have a by. website that I hate, but it's up. <laughs> <laughs> we had to kill the old one because it wasn't compatible with the store. Um, right. So that's up. Um, I get a lot of my my clients through, like I said, social media. Um, and then, so what's the website? It's uh, www.otisdemon.com. And then you're on all the social medias? Right? Uh, Instagram, Facebook, Instagram. Instagram is Otis underscore Damon. Facebook, you could just put Otis Damon. You can Google me and all my stuff comes up. And then, uh, so can I buy a hat online? or You can uh, so you can buy it you online, can. at least have a conversation and say, I want a custom hat and talk, and you'll talk to me and we'll exactly look at pictures of stuff and you'll mm -hmm. kind of get an idea of what I'm. Yeah. I usually do want to do, if you're, thank God for technology now, because if you're close enough, I can have a real conf consultation right. with you. If not, we can do a FaceTime or a duo or whatever, because I like to see the, the, the shape of your face, um, a little bit of your personality. And like colors and things colors I like, or fabrics like and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, um, amazing work. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. You Thank should be you. real proud. I mean, this is a big achievement. It is. Thank you. I appreciate it. And it is walkable from this studio. Yeah, so next time really you is. guys are down here, come on. Yeah. Come on by. It really is. For sure. And April, you must be so proud of this. Yeah, I mean, you asked the question, like, what is, what is, you know, was this what you felt like it could be? And I would say that Pop-Up Row in general way surpassed any of our expectations. You know, we continue to get, we have a big group text of everyone on the street. And we continue to get these texts that's like, oh my gosh, I just had my highest selling or my highest sales on a Monday. Or, you know, I just met this new person on a Wednesday that's going to give me a big order. And that kind of I mean, that kind of news just continuing to happen throughout the course of these months is is, is amazing. Um, it's something we just didn't expect and you can't plan for. But all of the pieces are falling into place and it's because we have the right people. That's right. And the spirit and the and kind of that same philosophy and everybody is trying to do a social good, including Newport. So uh, all of you should be proud. This is a, a big accomplishment and it's Thank a you. gift that Newport has given the community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And if somebody wants to get a hold of you at Newport, because you're looking for people's got to fill those buildings. That's right. They're not um, filling themselves. They're not. <laughs> uh, so best way to get in touch with me um, is just my last name, Stamel, at NewportUSRE.com. Uh, you can also follow us on socials, which is South Downtown, D-W-N-T-N. Um, and we, you know, our team is very small here. There's only six of us strong managing the process of the 48 buildings. So we're all very much involved in everything. Um, but we, we welcome community input and questions. And um, and what kind of cl clients are you looking for to fill those buildings? I mean, right now our focus is on local. Um, so the street level will be retail. Again, uh, you know, if you know anything about Atlantans, we like to eat and drink. So <laughs> high emphasis on food and beverage. Right. Uh, I think we've seen that soft goods does really well. So I think mm -hmm. there'll be some soft goods mixed in. 
uh, probably more than we originally thought, to be honest, because Papa Brew has shown us that there's a market for that and people will travel for it. Um, and then, you know, creative office tenants. So these buildings are, you know, 1907 old hotels in the upper floors. And you could just imagine the brickwork, the big wood beams. Um, they certainly are not office spaces you can find in the city very many places. So definitely looking for those tenants who are, who are interested in creative office space. So that could be co-working spaces. That could be marketing companies, advertising agencies, architectural firms. Yeah, anyone. We've got everything from, you know, on the office side, uh, probably as small as 5,000 square feet in some of our smaller buildings into our biggest building, which is a 1950s building, mid-century. <laughs> um, and it is, you know, we're looking for 100,000 square foot tenants. So we definitely scale both ways. So now how are you going about meeting those people? We have great retail and office broker teams in JLL, Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, they've been with us for several years, so they've been really patient. Um, and they've been learning the neighborhood right along with us. So they know what we're looking for. Um, you know, part of my biggest challenge is in the company is leading them in the right direction uh, and certainly showing them, you know, what we've done with Pop Up Row is helping to guide their, guide where they look for our tenants. Good stuff. Well, thank you for putting this show together. Yeah, we appreciate the time, you guys. All right. This is Lee Cantor for Stone Payton. We will see you all next time on GSU ENI Radio. Thanks, man. Thanks, you guys. That was really fun.